Welcome to Private Club Radio, your weekly source for industry education, news and discussion. Broadcasting from Tampa, Florida, ladies and gentlemen, here is your host, Gabriel Aloisi. Hey, we're back at it again for another edition of The Inbox this week with Rick Coffee, where Rick and I answer your burning membership marketing questions. We've had some awesome submissions from around the country come in, and we're happy to be answering those questions for you on this episode of Private Club Radio in the Inbox. This Inbox is really getting popular, and Rick and I are thinking that we should probably spin this show off. As a lot of you know, I launched the Golf Radio Network this summer. If you haven't already, check out golfradionetwork.com. You can listen to a new show by Ricky Potts, Wednesday Match Play, every Thursday morning. He actually does Wednesday Match Play as a live stream show on YouTube on Wednesday evenings, and the podcast is available Thursday mornings on the Golf Radio Network. I know it's kind of confusing, but this is going to be another show, The Inbox, coming to the Golf Radio Network here probably later this summer, so really excited about that. And just so you know, we're still actively looking for shows. If you know a great podcast out there or someone who's dying to create a podcast and they've got a good idea, I am open to the pitch. I'd love to hear the idea and see if it would be a fit for the network. In particular, I'm looking for a golf travel show. Anyone who does reviews of courses around the world that they've played, that would be an awesome show, I think. And the other show I'm looking to bring on the network is an equipment review show. So if you know anyone, a golf pro or just an amateur who loves gear, who would make a great host, please send them my way. Would love to get them on the golf radio network or at least have a chat and see if they're a fit. Without further ado, I'm turning the mic over to Mr. Rick Coffee for the inbox. And now, it's time to open up the inbox. Join your hosts, Gabriel Aloisi and Rick Coffey, as they tackle the most important questions in the private club industry. Well, welcome back, everybody. I'm very excited to announce that this is the sixth episode of the inbox. I am your host, Rick Coffey, and I'm always joined by the ever-entertaining, ever-knowledgeable Gabriel Aloisi. How are you, my friend? Hey, hey, Rick. How's it going over there? Excellent. Just can't wait for the holiday weekend to be coming near here. And uh, we have an excellent lineup of questions. All five of our questions were called in and we actually have some overflow questions for the next, the seventh episode here in a couple months. So excited about this. How you been? Fantastic. Yeah. I uh, playing a lot of golf right now, so I'm getting a little Good. better. Shot 78 and now 77 yesterday. So I'm, uh, I'm uh, pumped to get out there again this weekend myself. I tell you, you launched the Golf Radio Network, and now your golf game is uh, going down. Life is good. Got to step it up, man. Got to step it up. <laughs> well, let's get into this, all right? Yeah, let's do it. Question number one. All right. The first question comes from a friend of mine, Ben Keel, at privatecommunities.com. Gentlemen, considering the number of clubs that are surrounded by residential communities, how important is it for clubs to market to real estate? Yeah, I think it's it's huge, uh, a big opportunity there. And I recommend you have a strong commitment to building relationships with your local realtors because those are feet on the street for you and for your club. So definitely make those relationships, network with them, maybe host events for the local realtors in your community. I think that is a huge benefit that's just waiting for you. And then, of course, Ben, you know, I like your website a lot. In fact, I just recommended it to somebody just yesterday, in fact. And I think that websites out there that are promoting the real estate and looking for those potential members up in the Northeast and some of those corridors where they're moving down to places like Florida, I think that that can be a huge benefit and again, a great lead funnel for clubs. Rick, what's your take? Yeah, I agree. This is extremely important as well. A lot of my clients in the CRM world have the tie between real estate and, and memberships. So I think they, they go hand in hand. What I what I do think needs to happen is the club branding needs to be a little bit more 
uh, vivid or visual uh, in terms of where that uh, homeowner is going to look. So oftentimes you get a list of club names maybe when you go to a real estate website, but you don't get the feel, the branding of the club. So if we could have a website, and I believe privatecommunities.com may be the first to be doing this, where you could actually have the club's website or the club's branding right there on the real estate site, I think that's very important. And then another thing I've heard is oftentimes – if a club has a prospect, well, they have to hand that off to the realtor uh, for the property to be bought. And oftentimes then that transition, the membership director at the club actually loses you know, control there and loses pace with where that prospect may be in the home purchasing um, cycle. And so I think it's very important for that realtor and that membership director, like you said, to have strong communication so that the, the membership director and the realtor both are aware of where that prospect is in the sales pipeline. Great answer there, Rick. And we're going to turn now to our second question, which comes from Jeff Gilland of TPC Sugarloaf. Here's Jeff. Question number two. Hey guys, this is Jeff Gillen from TPC Sugarloaf. Love the show and was wondering if you could help me with uh, this question. We love getting referrals from current members or inquiries through our websites, but above and beyond that, prospecting is very necessary. When you're looking to build up your pipeline of prospective members, what are maybe your top two or three avenues to do this? And in what way do you contact them that has the most impact and potential response? Thanks guys. Have a great day. Oh, I love this question. This takes me back to my good old days. I, there's nothing I enjoy more than, than pipeline building. And so, Jeff, thanks for the question. And I would start with current members and their referrals along with the guests that have already been to your club. I see a lot of clubs around the country aren't keeping good tracks of those guests who have been out to the club, whether it's on the golf course, at the tennis courts, at the pool, dining, whatever it is. If a club can track those people, obviously it's going to be a hotter lead at that point because they've been to the club. They obviously know somebody at the club there. So they've experienced what the club feel is like. And I see that the, that, that grouping of guests and referrals who have been to the club is often not tracked really well. So I think if you hone in on those two areas, uh, Jeff, you're going to have some very strong, warm leads. Obviously, if we're looking outside of that and we're going to go into the cold sort of section, I do like the new home buyer list uh, that I often got at, at the clubs I worked at. And I try to be the first person to reach out to those people. You know, and we've all moved probably one or more times and we know how hard that is to move. So I always wrote them a letter or gave them a phone call and said, hey, while you're moving in, while you're settling in, let us take a night off for you guys. Come to the, the, the club. Have a have a dinner on us. You know, let's take a look around and get them away from the boxes and everything. So uh, start with the member referrals and the guests because those are the warmer leads. But then if we're going to look for building a, a prospect line, let's look at the new home buyer list. Great stuff, Rick. So I'm going to recommend a book that you should read. You should pick it up immediately. Go to membershipmarketingbook.com. <laughs> of course, uh, that's a shameless plug for my book. And there's yes, tons of these uh, pipeline building techniques in there. But I'll, I will give you two. I won't hold you waiting, <laughs> baiting you breathlessly. Uh, <laughs> I think that what Rick mentioned there, creating a, a organized membership referral program is probably obviously your best shot because those are your brand champions. Those are people who are already engaged who are already members, who love what you're putting out. At least I hope they do. Uh, find those people in your club and really turn them into champions for you with something that's incentivized for them, possibly. Uh, for, for again, outside leads, I'm going to go ahead with social media. Uh, specifically, I'd be looking at LinkedIn and Facebook. LinkedIn is great because with LinkedIn, you connect with them there and you actually have their email list. Uh, or you have their email address, which you can then put into an email funnel. You can do an automated series, for instance, send them maybe 12 emails over the course of a few months and, and give them some great information and, and keep track of them. I like Facebook because it can be so super, super targeted and you can find golfers out there who maybe like Rick mentioned, just moved into the area or mm -hmm. fit a certain age demographic, a certain income. You can get really hyper targeted there. So Facebook and LinkedIn would be my social media avenues. Those are good. Those are both good. Yeah. Yeah. If we take a look at all of those things, I think your pipeline is going to be pretty robust. Question number now three. Now we go to question number three, and this comes from Anna Lacey McMains at the Club Inc. in Birmingham, Alabama. And unfortunately, she let me know that this is going to be her final question in the private club industry for, for this time as she'll be moving on. But uh, thank you, Anna Lacey, for this call and, and all you've done for the industry. 
Hey guys, this is Anna Lacey McMains from the club in Birmingham, Alabama. I was just wondering, what is your take on referral incentives for current members bringing in prospective members? I know clubs have offered either cash or trips or food and beverage credit, but do you see these incentives as good or bad? Or can you offer any unique things that have really worked for other clubs? All right. So my take is that most private club members have a fair amount of disposable income or else they probably wouldn't be private club members to begin with. So I don't think that like the monetary benefits like, hey, here's a hundred dollar credit at the dining room or stuff like that really gets people excited. I think that you what does get people who have a high net worth excited are once in a lifetime extraordinary experiences, things that are exclusive um, access that's not everybody else gets. And I think the, if you can create some of those type of incentives, maybe it's trips or visits to a winery in Napa Valley. I've seen, um, really exclusive, uh, chef's tables, things like that, that you normally wouldn't get even if you had the money. I think that's the stuff that would get people excited. So give them that access. And I think you'll have some great results there. Rick, what's your take? Yeah, I think referral incentives are are almost a microcosm of a larger issue in our industry. Oftentimes, the answer to a lot of our questions is is incentives. And I I just think that's a low effort answer. And you're sort of just trying to throw a wide net out there to see who you could get. What I prefer when it comes to this is more of recognition uh, of the members who are giving you it. Oftentimes, that's what people really like. They like the, the spotlight to be on them. And if we're offering sales or trips. I do like the trips. If you're going to go with anything, something like you said, very exclusive would be my answer. But a healthy club, the members are going to naturally want to invite their friends and families to be members of the club. So I I think that's just the the route to go is, you know, get the club in a better position and then you'll see those referrals come into place. Um, But I also like to do in the recognition. I, I go back to when I was first at my first club, Hawthorne Woods Country Club in Chicago. It was an Arnold Palmer design. And so what we were looking at doing is creating the King's Court. It was a beautiful plaque that was going to be in the hallway where members would be going up and down and guests would be going up and down that hallway multiple times today. And what the King's Court was, was any member who had given two referrals that have turned into current members, they got their name up on the King's Court. Beautiful plaque that everybody got to see. And then that was highlighted, obviously, in club communications as well. And when you get something like that, it becomes You know, I think more of what a private club should be and the fact of recognizing that that these members have helped you out. And again, it's something that everybody's going to be able to see on a day to day basis. That's fantastic stuff, Rick. I love that answer. Question. All right. Here is question number four. It comes from Doug Ryan of Medina Country Club. Hey, guys, it's Doug Ryan from Medina. I was wondering, how do you still drive membership sales and interest when we are approaching the dog days of summer? and We begin to hear the. I'll wait until next year. Enrollment objection. Thanks. Look forward to the answer. Love this one and love Doug. He's a good friend of mine. And congratulations, Doug, on getting the the position at Medina. That's an extremely great club to be at. Uh, But this is a difficult one for anyone in the seasonal areas and a lot of the country is. But I always talk to my membership committee and boards about looking at these situations from a human perspective. If I were looking at a club, why would somebody join the club without an incentive in this time of year, whether it's the winter time, uh, late in the season? It's just unnatural for somebody to make a buying decision in, in those times. So you do have to give them something. And what I always tried to look at here and was very successful with it was deferred dues whether you're going to allow them to play golf right now, but only charge them social dues until the the beginning of the next full golf season there. That was always extremely successful. And people also like guest passes as well. You know, give them the opportunity. Well, if you're going to come on now here in July or August up here in the north, let's give you six, ten guest passes so that your friends can come out and it's not going to cost you anything as well. So that's what I, I always tried to, to sit down. Oftentimes pride at the board or membership committee level says, oh, I, I joined, they can join now. But you just have to take a step back and look from that person's perspective. And a lot of times it just doesn't make sense to pull the trigger now. So you've got to give them some nugget. And oftentimes for me, it was the deferred dues or the guest passes. 
How about yourself? I like the guest passes idea, by the way, because then mm-hmm. you're bringing more potential prospects yeah. to the club. I think that's a kind of hits both. Snowball. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. So, yeah, my take would be that people are motivated by scarcity, and I feel so strongly about this. I actually created a video today about it. And so if you follow mm-hmm. me on social media, you probably have seen this in the last couple of weeks. But uh, I really feel like you've got to set a limit and you've got to commit to it. So what happens is when you have a brand that's scarce, you say, okay, there's only 10 memberships left in this particular category. Get it while it while it's here before it goes. And when that type of thing happens, then people, it doesn't matter, you know, if it's the summertime, the wintertime, whatever, they're going to want to snatch those up. You can do scarcity sure. with either membership categories or you can do it by, hey, the prices are going up in September and this is your chance to get the price at lock in these rates right now. Otherwise, it's going up. So you've got to get people to commit to realize that they've got to act now or else they're going to miss out. Awesome. So hopefully that helps. And I think our next question actually maybe even will tie into that as well. Question number five. This next question comes from Erica Smith at the Atlanta Athletic Club. Here's Erica. Hello, this is Erica Smith with the Atlanta Athletic Club. Do you have any suggestions of how to market to an older demographic? And what would you do to entice somebody to join in their 50s, 60s, or beyond? Many clubs have incentives to join under the age of 40, but nothing is often done for those over 40. Yeah, Erica is completely correct here. I've seen very little across the country, if anything. Nothing really even comes to mind as far as incentives that I've seen for the older uh, demographic out there. And as you being the marketing person, I may let you answer this question as far as really answering what she just asked there. What I have seen and what I want everybody to concentrate on with this kind of question is when you're looking at these kind of things, always have the thought in mind, how many of my current members, full doing, full dues paying members would take advantage of this if we went in place. And that's oftentimes called cannibalization here in the industry of Maybe did we not think about how enticing this would be to some people who don't use the club a lot and all of a sudden you put something in place for these older members and you see 10, 20 percent of your full members go to this unexpectedly. So I want to make sure if we do go through the cycle of looking at incentives for this group, make sure that everything is looked at from the, the area of are my current members, my full dues paying members going to go towards this group because that could be dis- disastrous if you don't think about this. I will say before giving it over to you, these kind of members have usually been at clubs before, so they would be easier members to onboard to your club because they've probably been members of clubs before and they know how things work. So it is an enticing group for that aspect. So I'm going to stop there and give it over to you for possibly the the true incentive uh, area. All right, Erica. Well, the first thing that I want you to do is to immediately erase the word incentivization from your vocabulary when it comes to the marketing message of the club. Mm -hmm. Uh, Rick alluded to this earlier and he was right on. So what you want to do instead is you want to build value and showcase that value. So how do you do that? You create facilities and activities that appeal to that demographic and then you let everybody know about it. So how does that happen Mm -hmm. in, in practice? Some things that they want that we that work in other clubs and we've seen around the country, they want things like pickleball. The old guys like to play cards and get their poker in. The old ladies like to do mahjong. Um, they like the exclusive wine dinners and things like that. Come up with what those activities are. Just see what's working across the country and start to implement those things. Build out those, those amenities in your own club. And then if you want to talk about how do you actually go about reaching them, well, uh, if you want to get back to social media, I think Facebook, again, is the strongest one. That's the, the one that they're all using, that that age group is using. I'll give you an example. I showed my dad how to use Facebook just last uh, Father's Day, just a few weeks ago. And now he's literally like a Facebook addict (laughs) to the point where like if I post something or uh, my cousins post something, people in our family or his close friends, he's he's literally (laughs) I see him like responding within like a minute of it going up. So he must just be living on this thing. Uh, It's like I say it's like crack for old people right now. So (laughs) if if you want to actually get into where to market to them, I think Facebook is a great place. Well, great. This has been awesome. I think I, I want to thank everybody who who put in the questions. Those are wonderful. It was a good scope of questions for us to have. And I don't know if you remember, Gabe, in the in the first couple episodes at the end, we had always sort of stepped back and, and maybe yeah. talk about an off-topic area. Well, we, 
we're, we're recording this here right before the 4th of July. Yeah. I love, I love the food. I love the barbecue. So tell me, Gabe Aloisi goes to his 4th of July party, has a large empty plate in place with all sorts of fixings in front of you. What are you choosing to put on your plate? <laughs> All right, cool. Well, I, it, it's the 4th of July, so it's got to be very American, something that you don't get other places. So to okay. me, what's the most American food? I think really that's barbecue. So I'm heaping yep. on some pulled pork, probably putting in some coleslaw, maybe some mac and cheese, okay. uh, a potato salad or a macaroni salad, any of that good stuff, That that those ribs, burgers, hot dogs, oh. anything barbecue like that's what I'm going for. How about you, Rick? What do you, what's going on Rick's plate? Could not agree with you more barbecue. The more smoke I can have on my, uh, my plate, uh, you know, I just love that. So I, I'm a big ribs fan. I love the brats. Got to have the brats on there. Uh, I am going to put potato salad in there. A big thing. I don't think you mentioned this, uh, for me, deviled eggs. Oh, I wow. love to have those mm-hmm. here at the 4th of July. And then I think you got to wash it down with a, a few slices of watermelon at the end to clear the palate, you know, to move forward towards dessert as well there. So looking forward to it, hoping the weather here in Chicago cooperates for a great weekend. And with you being down in Florida, I'm sure you, you have no worries about that. Yeah, well, you enjoy it, Rick. And uh, I Thanks. can't wait to do another one of these inboxes with you in a month or so's time. Yeah. Absolutely. Well, thanks, Gabe. Appreciate the opportunity as always. And uh, episode seven is already in production. Want to be on the next edition of the Inbox? Visit privateclubradio.com slash inbox and leave us a voicemail. The best questions will get answered on the show. That's going to wrap things up for Private Club Radio this week. And I hope to see you back here next week. If you haven't already, check out our Facebook group. Just search for Private Club Radio on Facebook. It's called the Private Club Radio Listeners Forum. We'd love to have you join the conversation over there. Lots of fun stuff happening. Until next week, here's to your membership success. Private Club Radio is brought to you by the Private Club Agency, the premier marketing and consulting firm dedicated to helping clubs increase and retain their membership. Visit privateclubagency.com to learn more.